and welcome to worship. Before we begin, we do have a few reminders and updates. On Wednesday, November 2nd, the Church Council will meet at 6.30 in the Ladies' Parlor. And on Sunday, November 6th, the annual meeting of the Central Congregational Church of Orange will ha happen after the 1015 service in the sanctuary, or you can join via video conference or conference call. On Monday, November 7th, the Interfaith Neighbors Connecting or Inc. group will meet at 630 virtually. And if you are interested in joining that meeting, please let me know and I'll make sure to get you the link. And on Sunday, November 13th, the annual meeting of the Franklin Association Southern New England Conference of the UCC will be meeting at two o'clock. The meeting will be held at the Shelburne Center Church and can also be viewed virtually. Finally, we will be hosting the Ecumenical Thanksgiving service on Sunday, November 20th at 10 o'clock a.m. Please stay tuned for some more information on that service. Also a reminder that our cellar closet is open every Saturday from nine o'clock until 12 o'clock, that we have a drive-in worship service every Sunday at 9.15 in the Lawson lot, and worship in the sanctuary every Sunday at 10.15. Finally, we would like to wish a very happy birthday to Jack Arnott, who celebrates on the 28th. Now, as we turn our hearts and minds to worship, let us consider these words. Call on God's holy name. Praise God's wonderful works. Delight in God's miracles. Praise the Lord. I invite you now to join in our call to worship by responding with the words in bold type. Give thanks to the Lord. Call on God's holy name. Rejoice in the Lord. God fills our hearts with joy. Rejoice in the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord. Proclaim God's mighty works. Rejoice in the Lord. God's miracles are a wonder to behold. Rejoice in the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord. Trust in God's faithfulness. Rejoice in the Lord. This week, please continue to keep in your prayers Kent Lawson, Joyce Wilcox, and Karen Ball. Let us pray. Holy, gracious God, you have been our resting place throughout the ages. Generations come and pass away, but you abide forever. We praise you for your presence among us. You bring us comfort amid our trials, clarity where confusion persists, peace in the midst of conflict, and hope of eternal life. And so we give you thanks for family and friends, for life and love, for all the blessings you have bestowed upon us. O oh God, your desire for us leads the way. And so we ask that we may have ears to hear the cries of this world and the strength to respond with your hope. Fill us with your love that we may see deeply into all the needs around us. And may your love, your grace, your compassion, and your mercy carry us away and lead us with love to be your hands and heart in this world. We call for you to bear witness to our lives, to help us take the steps needed to serve you with love, compassion, faith, and understanding. Continue to remind us that it is our greatest duty to serve you and all God's people all over this beautiful and hurting world, to serve with hearts of grace and souls stitched with the love that you teach us and show us every day. Help us to free all that are bound up by injustice, racism, or cowardice. 
Help us to break through the boundaries that continue to tear us apart and help us to build your kingdom of love. Protect those who are surrounded by violence and help us to raise our voices against injustice. God of healing, bring strength and wisdom to the medical community as they work to bring healing to all those struggling with illness of body, mind, and spirit. God of mystery, we pray that you will continue to work in your mysterious ways. Help us to lend our hands to those who need healing and our hearts to those who need our touch. Help us to break through the fear of misunderstanding and suspicion to a world where we can all support each other. Help us to be enraptured by wonder and embraced by your presence. We pray these things through the name of your son, Jesus, who taught us to pray together saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. scripture lesson today comes from the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 1 verses 3 through 11 and chapter 3 verses 1 through 17. The words of the teacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Vanity of vanities, says the teacher. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. What do people gain from all the toil at which they toil under the sun? A generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun goes down and hurries to the place where it rises. The wind blows to the south and goes around to the north. Round and round goes the wind and on its circuits the wind returns. All streams run to the sea, but the sea is not full. To the place where the streams flow, there they continue to flow. All things are wearisome, more than one can express. The eye is not satisfied with seeing or the ear filled with hearing. What has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done. There is nothing new under the sun. Is there a thing of which it is said, see, this is new? It has already been in the ages before us. The people of long ago are not remembered, nor will there be any remembrance of people yet to come by those who come after them. For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to throw away stones and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to seek and a time to lose, a time to keep, and a time to throw away, a time to tear, and a time to sow, a time to keep silence, and a time to speak, a time to love, and a time to hate, a time for war, and a time for peace. What gain have the workers from their toil? I have seen the business that God has given to everyone to be busy with. He has made everything suitable for its time. Moreover, he has put a sense of past and future into their minds, 
yet they cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. I know that there is nothing better for them than to be happy and enjoy themselves as long as they live. Moreover, it is God's gift that all should eat and drink and take pleasure in their toil. I know that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it, nor anything taken from it. God has done this so that all should stand in awe before him. That which is already has been. That which is to be already is. And God seeks out what has gone by. Moreover, I saw under the sun that in the place of justice, wickedness was there. And in the place of righteousness, wickedness was there as well. I said in my heart, God will ju judge the righteous and the wicked, for he has appointed a time for every matter and for every work. Here ends our reading. May God add to our understanding of it. with a question. How many of you, like me, are involved in a never-ending battle against dirty laundry? Or maybe your battle is keeping the house clean or the lawn mown. If you're anything like me, it's tempting to just give up because it seems like the work is never done. As soon as you finish one load of laundry, there's three more waiting to be finished. And just as soon as you think the house might be clean enough, you notice that cobweb up in the corner. And once you get the lawn cut, you notice the new batch of weeds that sprouted up seemingly right before your eyes. It seems useless sometimes, doesn't it? All that work, for not. The author of our scripture lesson noticed the seemingly worthless nature of his work as well. He asks in our passage today, what do people gain from all the toil at which they toil under the sun? What do they get from all their work? If we look beyond the mundane drudgery of dirty socks or overgrown shrubbery, and look at the world around us, we see that even in the bigger picture, there are things we do over and over and over again that can start to seem meaningless. We work hard to feed the hungry or house the homeless, and yet there are still more mouths to feed or people without a roof over their head. We fight against injustice or oppression, but too often it seems like we've lost the battle. All around us, the world seems to tell us that our work is in vain. But our passage this morning really reminds us that our work is never actually in vain if we keep God at the center of our work. If we keep God at the center of our lives, we know that God is willing and able to come into our hearts and live there. But this question of how much room we are willing to give God kind of hangs there. There is this question of what place God takes in our lives. And we're reminded that unless God is at the very center, everything we do is in fact useless. If you have read the Harry Potter books, or maybe you've seen the movies, 
You might remember that Harry Potter lives under the stairs in the home of his aunt and uncle. They took in their orphaned nephew, which of course is commendable. However, they shut him up in a tiny little space under the stairs, a space they weren't using anyway. So often this is the kind of space that we give God in our lives and in our hearts. We allow God into our hearts or into our lives, but we only allow the spaces that we're not using. Those spaces that are dark or dingy, covered in cobwebs. Too often we welcome God in with this enthusiasm, but soon our lives call to us and we're tempted to push God back out. When we welcome God into our lives and keep God at the center, our lives can and our lives will change. Our lives will have meaning. More will be expected from us, but we will be challenged and changed. Paul reminds us that we will also be loved. Danish philosopher and Christian theologian Soren Kierkegaard tells the story of a prince. The prince wanted to find a maiden suitable to be his queen. One day while running an errand in the local village for his father, he passed through a poor section of the village. As he glanced out the windows of the carriage, his eyes fell upon a beautiful peasant maiden. During the ensuing days, he often passed by the young lady and soon fell in love with her. But he had a problem. How would he seek her hand? He could order her to marry him, but even a prince wants his bride to marry him freely and voluntarily, not through coercion. He thought he could put on his most splendid uniform and drive up to her front door in a carriage drawn by six horses. But if he did that, he would never be certain that the maiden loved him or was simply overwhelmed with all of the splendor that came with being a prince. He thought he could give up his kingly robe, move into the village and entered not with the crown on his head, but in the garb of a peasant. And that's what he did. He moved into the village and lived among the people. He shared their interests and concerns and talked their language. He got to know them. And in time, the maiden grew to know him and love him because of who he was and because he loved her first. This very simple, almost childlike approach reminds us that God came and lived among us. God had to reveal God's self to us in an understandable way. And that is precisely what God did through Jesus. God became flesh, just like you and me. God made himself understandable. Jesus gave everything up all because he loved us. Jesus died so that we could live. And that is love. God's love for us is deeper than the deepest ocean. God's love for us is wider than the widest mountain range. God's love for us is higher than the Milky Way. And God's love for us is all encompassing and so genuine that it moved God to give us all God had. So as we consider that, we come back to that question, how much space will we give God? Are, are we willing to give God our whole lives, even though that means making changes and being challenged? Do we welcome God into our hearts but soon tire of God's presence? Do we begrudgingly allow God into the understair space of our hearts 
offering only that space that we aren't using anyway? As we contemplate these questions, I close this morning with a transcript of a video I found online. I think it has some good images to remind us of the importance of putting God in the center of our lives. The video states, is God at the center of everything you do? Worship is powerful, but if God is not at the center, it's just music with no meaning. Prayer is incredible, but if God isn't at the center, it's just words with no meaning. Church is amazing, but if God is not at the center, it's just a weekly get together with no meaning. Put God in the center of everything you do, then everything you do will have meaning. God doesn't want just your actions. God wants you. God doesn't want your performance. God wants your heart. God loves you. God's love for you is higher than the highest mountain, deeper than the deepest ocean, and stronger than the power of death. Put God in the center. Amen. My friends, I hope everyone has a great week and I hope to see you soon. Take care. Bye-bye. And now may God bless you with the strength for the journey. May Christ lift you up from the raging waters of life and the Holy Spirit guide you with dreams full of hope and promise. May your heart sing God's praises, your spirit rejoice in God's goodness, and your life rest secured in the one who is faithful. Amen.